Uh, I will be putting it up on GitHub after the talk. We're going to try and do this uh, with, uh, with one hand. I don't know if you can hear me or not. Let me know if you can't. Um, so we're going to start out just talking about a normal Python function. Uh, this function is named foo, and it takes two arguments, a prefix and a suffix, and it combines those two arguments together by adding them with the string and between them. So uh, we can then call that function and pass it the strings foo and bar, and if we print the result, we see it prints foo and bar down there in the bottom left corner. Uh, see it now? Good. Okay. So um, what if we wanted to, uh, I'll try. Would it, so um, if we, what happens if we want to provide some information to the person reading this function? We can just stick a string in the beginning of the function body and describe the arguments and describe the return value. Uh, and that's great. It's human readable. It's right there where you want it. And Python actually makes this even more useful. Uh, and we can still run our function here, right? This adding the string doesn't break anything. And then if we, uh, Python actually gives us this, this function called help. And help actually knows what to do with that string. So when we run help, uh, it's going to print out that information we've provided. And that's awesome. So now we've got something that Python knows is there and humans can read. But it still has a little bit of a problem. Uh, and that problem is that even though Python knows it's there, Python doesn't, uh, doesn't understand it. It just sees it as a string. So we know that the help function can see this. Uh, so how does that happen? And it, the answer is that Python stores this. Python stores this as uh, the doc attribute of the function. So if we print out the doc attribute here, we can see it still prints that same string. So there is something programmatic happening here. Python is storing a reference to that string that we can then access whenever we access the function. But it's still not structured. It doesn't know that the string, the first word, is related to the prefix, and that the string, the last word, is related to the suffix. So one way to solve this is to imbue this string with additional meaning and use some tool to parse information out of it. Uh, and that's what Python has done historically. But wouldn't it be great if right in the language there was a tool for giving structured information like this? about the arguments and the return value of the function, rather than just giving a string. Um, well, in Python 3, there is. So you can see here uh, what function annotations in Python look like. The uh, prefix, suffix, and return value strings that I had in my doc string are now here right in the function definition. So after the prefix, I just add a colon, and then whatever I want, whatever and then want. whatever I want. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't have to be a string. Uh, and then you stick a comma, and then you do the same thing for the next one. You put a colon, and then whatever you want there. And then you close your parentheses, just like usual. And then you put in a little arrow, rocket, whatever you want to call it, and uh, another whatever you want. And then a colon, just like at the end of every function definition. So if we look back at what a normal one looks like, you see it's still one, then a comma, then the other, then close parentheses, and then a colon. So all of that is the same here. None of that changes. We just added some extra stuff in between. So if we run this function, it still prints foo and bar. Great. So all of this is still valid Python. Uh, and if we run the help function here, uh, it actually still gives us all that information. So we haven't lost anything here. What we've done is we've taken unstructured data in a string and made it structured data around in the function definition. And 
Python still gives us this useful help when we ask it. So we're still doing pretty well. Um, so we saw with the string that Python was storing it in the doc attribute. So where is it storing uh, this information? The answer is in the annotations attribute. So we're going to use pprint here instead of regular print because unlike the string we had before, annotations is going to be a dictionary. So we want to be able to see that a little better. So if I run this function, I, I see that it, pprint is printing out uh, a dictionary with the keys being the, the two arguments plus a key that's called return. That, and those have those three strings in them. So this is great. We have all the information we had before, except now it's structured. And we can access it on the function in a structured manner. So like was mentioned before, these annotations can be not anything, but a lot of different things. Any valid Python expression. So you can have the prefix annotation be 10 plus 5. And you can have the suffix annotation be the function len that gives you the length of a sequence in Python. And then you can have the return value be a list of a set of a tuple, which is meaningless, but looks funny. So if we just run this, we see that we get that same annotations object, except that they're no longer just strings. You get, you get 15. It's added the 10 and 5 together. You get the length function, and you get your strange list. So what if we wanted to do something else with this? Instead of just providing strings, which are human readable, what if we wanted to provide something readable to the computer? If we just were going to provide strings, the very first thing we did, the doc string, where we just added a string inside the function, that worked great. Um, but if we wanted to provide something for the computer to read, uh, we, could make, we could do that. So in this case, this function, it takes two strings, and it returns a string, right? So let's tell the computer that. Let's annotate that we're passing in a string for the prefix, a string for the suffix, and a string for the return value. So again, this is valid because you can pass in pretty much whatever you want in here. You still the fun run the function, and you still get foo and bar as your result. Um, so, so this is cool. But what happens if I try and pass in 1, 2 instead of strings? to the function? Um, the answer is it doesn't work. So, And we get the same error we always got. So even though, in a sense, we've told Python that these are strings and it's going to return a string, it's still giving us the same error it would have given us otherwise. So even though Python has these annotations, it's not using them for anything. Python doesn't interpret the function annotations. All it does is stick them in a dictionary for you to use however you want. So this is where external tools come in. Uh, and the most popular one is called MyPy. Uh, and if you're downloading it with pip or easy install, uh, it's called MyPyLang, not the MyPy package. So if you try and pip install MyPy and it doesn't work, that's why. So if we take MyPy and we use it to run this program instead of regular Python, it's going to tell us that we have errors. It's actually going to read those function annotations say, see that we're expecting strings and tell us that we're calling it with integers instead of strings. So argument 1 has an incompatible type int. Argument 2 has incompatible type int. So this is great. Now we've got a way to actually check the type of our, func of our arguments to our function and its return value. Now, a lot of us may use Python specifically to avoid doing this. Uh, it's not required. Uh, it will never be required, but it is an optional layer on top of Python that can be really useful. So what happens now if we provide it the right type? So if I run this program through MyPy, it doesn't find any errors, right? But we're passing it empty strings instead of strings that have some useful value that we're going to want to print. If I run this. It just prints out the word and. So that's not really useful. So we're going to change our function so that it does something more useful when it gets empty strings. So in this case, we're going to make it so that if both the prefix and suffix have values that are not empty, it's going to add them together like before. But if they're both empty, it's going to return none. So now when we run this function, it returns none because we've passed two empty strings. But what happens now when we call mypy? 
Okay, it's saying incompatible return type value got none expected string. So it can actually tell that our function can now return none. It can tell that uh, it's no longer always going to return a string. So we need some way to tell MyPy it's OK if you get a string, but it's also OK if you get none. So this is why we're doing all of this on Python 3.5, uh, is there's a new module in the standard library called typing. And typing has a bunch of useful types in it that allow you to do things like return either a string or none. Uh, so if we change only one little thing about this function definition, which is instead of saying that it returns a string, we say it returns an optional string. The return value of our function won't change, but our uh, type checker is going to accept it. So it now doesn't find any errors because we've told it we're only going to optionally return a string. We may actually return none. So this is cool, but it's pretty specific, right? All we've allowed ourselves to do is have either a string or none. We haven't said a string or maybe we want to turn a string or an integer. How do we do that? Well, the typing module has a lot of these useful types in it. Uh, and the more generic type than optional is called union. So if we want to keep our function the same, but make this type annotation more generic, we can use the union to say, all right, we're going to return either a string or none. And we're saying it explicitly here by providing it with string and none to the union type. So optional is just a more specific union type than union in general. So if you're interested in more of the types than in the standard library, just uh, do help typing in your REPL, and you'll be able to find out more about it. Um, and again, if we run this program using union instead of optional, it still doesn't find any errors. So that's a valid way to tell MyPy that your type is either going to be a string or none. Cool. So we've done a bunch here, all right? And we've seen how we can use MyPy to enforce typing. But what else might we want to use function annotations for? We saw that you can use them to provide human readable strings, but Python already has a way to do that. You can already just specify a doc string. And you've seen you can use it to do type hinting and then use an external tool to enforce that type. But what else might you want to do? Does anybody have ideas for what they might want to do with type hints or with function annotations in general, other than enforce static typing? Yeah. You might want to do something like say, is this a unique password that's not in the database already, or some wacky thing that So like a validation. Yeah, like you go out to a third party thing. Whatever, okay. Like something really contrived like that. Yeah, in the back. Uh, help with autocomplete. So it knows the uh -huh. available methods. Yeah, that's awesome. That's it, it seems kind of similar to type hinting, right? You're saying you're giving more information about this parameter and what its possible values are, which that's what type is, right? A type is a, a limit on what value something can have. So you're, you're describing something very similar to typing. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely something you can do. And I'm going to talk a little more about that one in a minute. That's the answer I was looking for. Um, yeah, so automatic documentation was mentioned up in the front. Uh, that's a good one, too. But there's already a lot of tools to use doc strings to do that. So it's not clear to me you'd want to rewrite all your doc strings over to this new format. Sheila. Uh, I love uh, sending uh, events to an event monitoring system and to have an annotation around it that would get some information to the system. OK, that's awesome. That's almost like, in another language, you might almost define a type to do that that knows to when it's operated on to send an event. So that's, it's still, we're, we're kind of getting all to the same idea, more information about the parameters. Validation between parameters, like min has to be less than max. Interesting. That's not something I would have thought of, because I think of them as being independent. But once they're all accumulated in that dictionary, you can do anything with them. So all of these are things that are possible. What last one in the back? Unit testing or, uh, or similarly fuzz testing to make sure that the bugs actually being tested. OK, so you might give like limits for a region to fuzz test over or something like that? OK, cool. Uh, I'm sorry. That's it. That's all we have time for. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's, yeah. Um, so there's lots we can do here. And I'm going to show an example of, doing, uh, of 
changing types. So here, I still have type annotations here, right? I say, I'm going to take strings, but now I'm going to return a Boolean. And so what I mean by them here is not that I expect to get past this type, but I want you to convert whatever gets past this function to that type. So I've got this convert method that I've written that does that. So we can look really quick at what it does. It, you've got a prefix and a suffix and a result key in your annotations. And they're going to be string, string, and bool, as we saw on the last screen. Uh, and then we're going to convert the prefix to this new type. So the integer 3 will be converted to the string 3. The same for suffix, the integer 4 to the string 4. Then we're going to call the function with these new values that have been type converted. We're going to convert the result. So the result is going to be the string 3 and 4. And we're going to convert it to a Boolean, which is true. So now when we call this function, when we run this code, uh, we're going to get the value true. And if I now change it and I pass it these empty strings, which are going to make the function return none, and I run it again, it's going to return false. And if you look at the convert method again, you can see why. When you convert the inputs from an empty string, it's going to stay an empty string. But the output of the function is going to be none. And when you convert it, it's going to end up false. So now you've got a great way to convert inputs of your function to the type you want. Now, I have actually used this to write some mathematical functions where you don't know you might get past like a raw string, you might get past a list of integers, or you might get past a single big integer, but they all represent the same information encoded in different ways. And by saying this function is only ever going to operate on a list of integers, I can have the code automatically convert any of those input types to that one type. So that's all I have. So generally think about function annotations as being for typing somehow, but they can be used for anything. Python doesn't care. Uh, and yeah, I'm glad to take a couple questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the question is, uh, when I have string here, does it enforce that it is a string, or could it be like a subclass of string? Uh, and the answer is, I have no idea. Um, my pi, I would imagine that it would be is subclass, because that's how you know, object-oriented programming works. But that is only an assumption. I'd bet money on it, but it's just an assumption. That's the last, that was the last OK. Question. Sorry. Uh, unfortunately, I'm out of time, but I'm glad to take questions afterwards. Thank you very much. You know?